In this video, I'm going to provide an introduction to some of the items that we need to take into consideration with regards to inventory. And the first thing I'll say here is uh, let's clarify some of the things that we are allowed to include as part of, of inventory, or to be more specifically, the amounts that we are allowed to capitalize. So let me modify that. And what I mean by that, anytime in, a, in accounting we say an amount to be capitalized, what we are referring to is what amount can I include as part of the asset? So with respect to inventory, uh, it's obvious that the cost, the initial cost of that inventory can be capitalized to inventory. But what may not be so obvious sometimes is that also allowed to be capitalized are all expenditures that are necessary in acquiring and converting that item into a sellable condition. So this may include items like taxes, freight to get all your inventory uh, to a sellable condition, and even labor and other items. So if you need to have somebody come and uh, do some work on this particular item to be able to have it in a sellable condition, those amounts can be capitalized or included as part of the cost of the item. And what, what this does is that from the company's perspective, this allows the company to avoid expensing all these costs that normally would have been expensed uh, until you actually sell the good. So during the time that you hold that inventory item, all these items are being classified as assets as opposed to expenses. Like normally we expense freight, normally we expense tax. But if you're in a scenario where you are dealing with inventory and those in those items, those costs are uh, related to the inventory, you can capitalize them and keep them as an asset until the moment that you sell that good. And then of course, once you sell that inventory item, then you recognize your revenue, but you're also gonna recognize your cost of goods sold, which will include these factors here. Um, apart from the original cost and the necessary uh, cost in converting to a sellable condition, Sometimes you can even capitalize insurance on loans. So if you take out a loan related to uh, an inventory item, then you may be able to capitalize that interest as opposed to expensing it. Now it's not, uh, it's under very restricted uh, situations and those involve either a company that makes a discrete type inventory item. And what that means is a low volume production of something that takes a long time to manufacture. So imagine a ship uh, builder or somebody building a, uh, uh, some uh, structure. And what ends up happening is that since this production expands over several periods, then the logic is that companies that take out a loan should be able to include the interest related to that, that uh, construction or that, uh, the manufacture of that inventory item as part of the inventory, good, uh, inventory cost. This is not related. In other words, we are not uh, referring to high volume type production environments. For those that the rules do not apply. This is only for discrete type inventory items where we're allowed possibly to capitalize the interest on the loans. Now, there are many rules regarding this. And uh, even if you are, even if, excuse me, even if you are working on a discrete type inventory item, sometimes you may not be able to capitalize that interest. So if you want to look at the rules for that, that's, there's a separate video on capitalize, capitalization of interest. So the details are in there. Also, another uh, scenario in which you are allowed to capitalize interest is if, you're make, if the company is making an asset, like a fixed asset for its internal use. So if you're, if you're making your own machine that eventually will be classified as a fixed asset, as property plan equipment, then during the time that you're manufacturing that that equipment or that fixed asset, you may be able to capitalize interest on their loans. So overall, look at the big picture here. What we're saying is in terms of inventory, we are obviously allowed to capitalize the cost as part of that inventory item, but we also have a whole bunch of things out there that can be considered part of the cost of the inventory and it is allowed to be capitalized. Even interest on loans may be able to 
be capitalized for that inventory item. Okay, and that and this is important for the uh, for the uh, company that's dealing with this inventory because of the fact that again it delays the expensing of those items until you actually recognize revenue for the sale of those items. Um, another thing that needs to be discussed here is uh, depending on shipping terms, we may have to ask ourselves what goods are included or excluded as part of inventory on the balance sheet. And this may sound uh, uh, quite elementary, but it's really, it really is an important thing that occurs in real life. So, you know, you may have, uh, depending on the shipping terms, you may have to include or exclude inventory items that you don't have on hand at your business yet. So there are some shipping terms that we talk about in the, in the, in the class, FOB destination, FOB shipping point, and many other shipping terms are out there. But I will say this, there is one main thing that you got to think about. The key to this is to ask yourself when and where does title transfer to the buyer? Okay, when, do the, the tra when does title transfer from the seller to the buyer? And it is at that point in time and that place that everything changes. Because once, once title transfers to the buyer, then the seller is no longer responsible for those goods. So if you think about it, once title transfers, the seller is no longer paying for shipping. Uh, the seller is no longer paying for insuring that uh, inventory item. Once that title transfer, all that shifts to the buyer. So let me give you an example here. Suppose we have uh, FOB destination. And under FOB destination, the, tra the title transfers when the goods arrive to its destination, okay? And uh, just for illustration purposes, FOB shipping point, title transfers once the goods leave the shipping point, the place where it's, where it's being sold from. So let's do an example with FOB destination first. Assume we have a company here in Florida and we ha we're selling some items to a company in New York. So in that case, the terms would be, if it were a FOB destination, it would be FOB New York. You know, you normally don't see destination, you would see the actual place where it's going. So what that means is when we sell these goods, title is gonna transfer here from here, Florida, title is gonna transfer in New York. So since title transfers in New York, the shipping from Florida to New York falls on the seller because they're, they are our goods. Uh, if we want to ensure that, ensure the transportation of those goods, then that cost falls on the seller again until it reaches New York. Because once it ne reaches New York or the uh, place where it's going to be received, then at that point it is no longer ours and we have the seller will have completed their obligation. Uh, as an uh, alternatively, let's say it's FOB shipping point, and this would say FOB Florida if it were FOB shipping point. So what that means is that once it leaves the company's shipping dock here in Florida, then the goods now belong to the buyer. And what that means is that since the goods belong to the buyer in Florida, the buyer is the one that's gonna now pay the shipping costs. The buyer is gonna pay the insurance, etc. And it's the person that assumes the risk of loss, the buyer in this case. So this, this thing that I call here the key thing, determine when title transfers, that's what determines who's got the risk of loss. And based on the risk of loss, we can determine who has to pay for insurance, who has to pay for shipping, et cetera. All right, and just a, a couple other things that I think are worth mentioning here and that we have to be careful with because these items that I'm gonna illustrate right here are not considered sales. And sometimes they uh, sound like a sale, but they're not. And we have to be careful not to put them in our books as a sale. So let me give you the first example here, dealing with consigned goods. So when you send consigned goods to a retailer, what you're doing is, uh, let's say you're a manufacturer and you sell uh, item A, and you take this to a consignee, uh, a consignee, 
right? You're, if you're the one with the goods, you're the, you know, the manufacturer, you would be considered the consignor. You take these goods, item A, to consi the, consign the consignee and ask them to place them in display to sell. And if they don't sell, then the consignor, which is the company itself, the manufacturer, will take them back. So under these arrangements, the consignee agrees to accept the goods for sale, but the consignee does not assume liability for that purchase. And th so this is not a sale. We got to be careful. It only becomes a sale to the manufacturer once the consignee sells it. But if the consignee does not sell it, the consignee has the right to send it back to the consignor and not assume the purchase. So if you find yourself or a company finds themselves in this type of arrangement, they should not be recording the sale simply because they transfer the goods to the consignee. Okay? And we have to be careful with that. Now, eventually it can be a sale, but that is dependent on whether the consignee sells it or not. Another one where we have to be careful with is these sale buyback type transactions. And sometimes they're referred to as parking transactions. And I'll explain a little bit about this, but let's start by saying that this is not a sale. If, if, I, am, if, I, if I have some goods that I'm selling, that's where the sale occurs here. But then under that agreement, I also have an agreement to buy it back later. Then even though this initial sale looks like it's a sale, the fact that there's a buyback provision makes it where it is not a sale. And, you know, some of you may be wondering, why would a company do this, right? Sell something to buy back? Well, sometimes companies want to transfer certain assets out of their balance sheet uh, or uh, many other reasons. And that's why we call them like a parking transaction. Basically, they're parking that asset in another company's books for a period of time. And then later on, when they buy it back, it, it comes back to their balance sheet. So when you see something like this, where you have an arrangement with a sale buyback, uh, we got to make sure and make sure that that's we got to make sure that that's not considered a sale on the books. Okay. In other words, you might have this contract. The goods might actually go to another party, but on your books, on the books of the company that initially sold this, that inventory item should still remain, and no revenue should be recognized. All right, and then lastly. Uh, another one we've got to be careful with that we cannot treat as a sale initially is environments where we sell uh, with unpredictable rate of returns. So what that means, let me correct the spelling here, sorry. What that means is if I sell items to a company, but I give them the right to return anything that they don't sell, Right, and I'm not sure what percentage of those sales were, are, were will probably be returned. Then at that point, I cannot recognize the revenue. I cannot treat that as a sale. Now, if if later on, I you know, and it happens over time as you start working with a, a particular retailer or a, you know, as you sell your goods to somebody that you don't know, over time you start actually knowing what their rate of return is. And once you know what their rate of return, then you can start recognizing a sale based on that expected value of the revenue. So this is you're not a sale until the returns can be reasonably estimated. So at the point in time where you can actually say, okay, we're probably going to get 15% of these items back, then that becomes a scenario where you say, okay, since I have an expectation that 15% of it will come back, then let me recognize 85% of the revenue of the things that I sold uh, to this particular buyer. Okay, so I want you to be very careful with these because there are situations in which things appear to be a sale, but they are not. And one of the things in accounting that is very important to us is substance over form. Okay, and what that means is even if we call something a sale, uh, like in this case, or in this particular case, or even a sale of consigned goods. It might be called, you know, sale of consigned goods. Even if you have something like that, 
um, even though it sounds like a sale, so that would be inform a sale, when you analyze the actual mechanics of, this, of the transaction itself, in substance, it is not a sale. So always in accounting, we're looking at transactions for what they really are, independent of what it's called. And that's something that, that is very common in accounting that you need to uh, be, uh, always be thinking about. All right, this concludes the introduction to inventory.